can start. Welcome everybody back to the fourth day of our summer camp uh, and the strand on digital textual scholarship. Today uh, the, the will be dedicated to the materiality of texts and we have two experts. Uh, it's our first uh, presentation today by uh, Alberto Campagnolo who is really a world expert on, on uh, manuscript studies and he will uh, give, introduce you oh that's my daughter calling sorry <laughs> uh, he will introduce you us to um, uh, cool. so uh, um, Alberto Campagnolo is uh, adjunct professor from uh, Udine University of Udine and uh, currently visiting scholar uh, at the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities working on my daughter sorry <laughs> Uh, working on a, a model for describing book bindings, so a digital model uh, for describing book bind bindings. Today he will uh, introduce us to uh, uh, a collation tool, so how to describe the collation of medieval uh, codices, and he will talk about advanced imaging technologies to uh, analyze the materiality of uh, uh, manuscripts. Uh, Alberto. Thank you, Franz. Okay, let me do the presentation. Okay. And do okay. Can you see the slides? Okay. Right, so presenting this way is always a bit tricky because I, I can only see my slides now and I can't see you also. Uh, if you have any questions or representations, do speak up and we'll come back to the to the room to see what uh, people are doing and saying. Um, so yes, as Franz uh, mentioned, uh, today we'll be looking at uh, materiality. And uh, so we look basically at everything but the text today. And uh, just the brief uh, overview, I in my previous life, I was a book conservator and then I turned digital humanist. That's, that's why my interest into the materiality of the object. And uh, it's uh, the way in which we can actually translate all of this formation that we have of the object into the digital. So to start off, uh, we start to consider how the book can be considered as an object. And uh, the, inform the images that you see on the screen here are a representation of the binding of the manuscript we've been working uh, with since uh, Monday. Um, I wonder how many of you actually went to look at the at the binding that was uh, represented in the images that we will be working with. Immediately, it's not the most beautiful of bindings. It's it's a late binding. It's not contemporary to the object to the to the manuscript, but still, it's part of the object, and there is information in this. In this object that we will, it would be good to be able to transpose into the digital in order to have a better understanding of how the whole thing works. So when we consider books as objects, we can see that they are actually complex entities and they bring a lot of information with, with them on top of what they contain, so on top of the uh, of the text of the manuscript, the, the illumination, the decoration, on top of all of that, we have other information that is included in within the object, and which we can be uh, identified as material culture. So we have technological information about how the uh, book was put together, starting from the manufacture of the parchment and uh, material data, uh, the kind of pigments were used, the kind of inks, uh, the way in which the uh, gatherings were formed. So a lot of information is there, which is not normally transposed into the digital. 
because normally when we see manuscripts and books represented in the digital, all we get is information about the content and decoration. And we, we do get some information about the rest, but it's normally just as a hindsight or on the side, as there's not a lot that we can actually glean about the object from what we get digitally. Which means that normally the book as an object is considered as a black box. What do we mean by this? Uh, we are bother borrowing a term from the information scientists and actor nectar theories, whereby a black box can be a technological artifact that while it can appear as obvious, so we all know how a book works. We all know how the book codex format works. We know how the, the pages flip around and uh, we have a cover around it that protects it. So we all know it, we kind of uh, give it for granted. But this uh, thing that we take for granted is actually can be regarded as a complex entity, which means that we have a lot of systems, techniques, materials and processes that actually are working inside this black box in order for this flipping of the pages to work. So what we'll try to do uh, today is to try and see whether we can... Alberto, yeah? can I... Uh... Can I just interrupt you? Because uh, we, we don't uh, we don't see the, the slides. Oh, uh, okay. but they are stuck. They are stuck in the first the first slide. Oh, okay. Sorry, I don't know yeah. what. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we can see it. Okay. okay. So let me just go back a little bit. <laughs> so this is the the binding of the manuscript that we've been working with, and. Uh, and we are we are stuck here at the uh, at the black box. So what we will try to do today is to try and find a way in order for us to be able to open up this black box and see whether we can actually take information and transpose that into the digital. So normally, when we digitize books, what happened? We take pictures of the um, rectum verse of the images uh, of the of the pages. And we end up with these sequences of images. Uh, and uh, admittedly, more and more, basically uh, all the time now, actually, you do get information. You get pictures also about the bindings, as we've seen from uh, the example that we're working with. But still, these putting images into sequences in this way, it's carrying on this concept of the black box, ignoring a lot of things that are actually happening in the object. Because what we are working with is a book in codex format, which means that, you know, can be defined as a collection of sheets of any material. We have these sheets, we fold them double, so we fill, fold it in half, we put it together in gatherings usually, so, you know, depending how many uh, pages, uh, leaves per gathering depends on the uh, the culture uh, of the manuscript behind it, or sometimes it's actually casual. And we sew them together, we put it together in, into a text block, and we usually put, to, put around it a binding that protects the whole thing. So there is a lot of stuff that happens there in order for us to be able to flip the pages. What's important to remember here is actually at the very essence of the book in codex format, is this folding sheets in half and putting into gatherings. And this is actually, uh, as um, Patrick Andres and um, Paul Canale Maniaci uh, said very, very clearly in their uh, La Sintasu Codex, is that the gathering is the ultimate working unit of the codex. So if we ignore this working unit, we are actually ignoring a lot of information, a lot of things that actually happen to the book. And these floating pages, as we see, uh, ignore this, this very true fact that these leaves that we have are actually conjoined at some point and put together into gatherings. Instead, what we get is exactly these, float, as I call them, floating pages. You know, the, you don't have any information on who was with what and how the whole world things were actually sewn together and gathered together. Now, as we will see this afternoon, with standards like AAAF, you can do a lot of wonderful things with these floating pages. But when it comes to understanding the object, these floating pages are lacking a lot of information that's actually essential to the object. 
So to try and find a way for us to actually get this information into the digital, let's look at how a codicologist or a codicologist book would look into the book and try to understand it so that we can actually see how we can actually get this information and see whether we can actually get into, into the digital. When I think of this, I often go back to this. Uh, it's actually a short uh, paper that was written in 1972 by Gruis, which highlights three basic method methodological principles in order for us to study the book as an object for the colleagueologists and then get into this information you know, to the larger community of scholars looking into the book. So these uh, basics, uh, uh, they're called uh, principles, but I actually like to call them as uh, stepping stones because you are going from one to the other in order to get to a much uh, better understanding of the object. So the first stepping stone would be that you need to be able to describe in detail and accurately the physical aspects of the object that's been investigated. Then you can get into a description, uh, like a, making, making a synthesis of the information that you gleaned from this description. So you can actually start to highlight the evolution of the books. And finally, on, this, on the last stepping stone, you can actually take this information and put it into context uh, with uh, the content of the book and also all the other information that we have about the book in, uh, in essence. So to put this into uh, in like a, in a pyramid, at the very bottom of it, you will have this description of the physical aspect of, of the object. Without that, you can't do anything else. So this description is our first most important thing that we need to try and, and do and, uh, and be able to actually bring into the digital if you want to do actually do this into the digital uh, level. Uh, first, let's do a couple more um, introductions about terminology. So we often speak about physicality and materiality as two synonyms, but actually I would like to distinguish these two uh, concepts a little bit. By physicality, we can in, uh, intend the infinite set of physical attributes to, that make up the reality of an object. So everything that actually makes it a real object in, uh, in 3D and or even 4D in our, in, in our life, it's what this physicality is. But when we look into materiality, we can actually see materiality as an emergent property, which means that it depends from, the, from our attention. So what do we want in order to understand the object, well, what are we? What are our interests? What are the ways in which we want to gather information about this physicality in order to study the object? So it's a, it's a selection of attributes that we are looking into in order to be able to understand the object, and these can be uh, termed as materiality. So we take some information from this whole infinite set of information that we have in the object and we are, we focus on those and we gain information from that once we have that we can try and see whether we can actually transpose this into the digital and today we'll briefly look into how we can do this for gathering structures for material materials and for book binding structures now digitization is usually uh, defined as the capturing of pages of, of the content of pages uh, through photography and imaging. I would like us though to make a bigger uh, definition, a wider definition that can actually get us a little more information. And so we could define the digitization as any action directed at the computerization and transmutation of books and their features and bring this into the digital in order for us to be able to get this information and use this data. Now, generally, as we've seen, uh, the, the major way for us to get information into a digital is uh, through visual means by photography and imaging. 
and we've seen, you know, we take the images of the pages and we have the information about the text, we information about the illumination, we, we have a lot of stuff there, but there's, there's, there are things missing. Also, uh, we have traditional photography and we have advanced photography or advanced imaging technologies. Let's try and see what else the advanced imaging technologies can give us. Still through visual means, but uh, because um, they're getting more information because of their advanced status, we can actually start to glean more information about the actual physicality of the object through this. So one first important technology that's been applied to uh, manuscript studies since the early 2000s uh, is multispectral imaging. Now, multispectral imaging is usually uh, understood as the way in which we can actually glean and read uh, the undertext from a palimpsest, but this is not all that multispectral imaging allows us to do. And this is an image of the uh, Archimedes palimpsest, um, which was actually the first manuscript on which multispectral imaging was applied for manuscript studies. And it's a very famous uh, project. So what happens when we uh, digitize things from multispectral imaging? We have the object on our copy stand. We have a dedicated camera, which is actually an achromatic camera, which means it doesn't record color, but only uh, light inputs into its, uh, into its uh, chips. And then what we do, we illuminate the object at very specific uh, wavelengths from the very benign uh, UV through to the blue and all the visual down to the red and uh, down to the infrared. And we take an image for each one of these, uh, of these wavelengths in which we are illuminating the object. So what happens? We have something like this. The light shines on the object and we take pictures every time a different light comes, comes on the object. As I, I got to repeat this. And you can see as light changes, we can see some features more or less because materials react differently to different wavelengths. And we can start to try and use this way in which mater different materials react differently to the light to different wavelengths in order to actually try to clean information and understand better what we are looking at. So uh, to give a more uh, and, and, and another example, let's have a look at this page. Um, as I said, the uh, images that we take from multispectral imaging are uh, black and white because the camera is achromatic, but because we have information about each different wavelength in which we are actually illuminating the object, we can, we can reconstruct the uh, color image from the set of uh, black and white images that I'm going to show you in a second. And actually we have a much better palette because we have, depending on how many wavelengths, but way more than the three uh, RGB, uh, red, green, and blue uh, colors that we normally have for uh, color uh, photography. So when we take the images, we, as I said, each time we illuminate the object with a different uh, wavelength, we take a photograph. And we end up with a stack like this one. And as you can probably start to see, things change and we can start to see some uh, items more than others, some disappear and until we get to the very end where actually only some are visible. And this is a sad because material, different materials react differently to the light. So we can start to get information from this stack of images, but also we can remember that all of these images are taken at the same time, which means they are, let's say, uh, completely registered. There are some problems with some filtering, but for the most part, uh, you can actually say that at each pixel, in each image, you can you can actually go and go to the next slice, the cold slice of this stack, to the next slice and find exactly the same part of the object at the same coordinates. So we can actually start using 
the third dimension in order to get information throughout the full stack of images, not just looking at how one material disappears on the infrared and appears on the UV, for example. And uh, you can plot this information to understand how the different materials react differently. On that page, we did some uh, spectral curves, and you can see how the paper, the inks, the blemishes of the of the of the object all react differently to the uh, to the light, and we can basically just find numerically the luminance reflectance actually of each uh, of each pixel or area and plot that and we can we can we end up with these very uh different curves one for each different material which allows us to compare materials on the same page and say oh these two these two inks look exactly the same to the naked eye but actually when we do uh the when we plot these uh, spectral curves we can see that actually these are very different so for example if any of these were a forgery, you will actually be able to see very clearly that although at the naked eye, they look like the exactly the same ink, there are different compositions chemically. Um, what's interesting is that if you have enough uh, wavelengths, you get a, a resolution that's high enough that allows you actually to be able to recognize materials and pigments even though you don't have them you don't have it all on your same page so you can actually identify materials according to the spectral curves through libraries of spectral curves for this for happen you need to have you know a, a given number of uh, spectral curves given through uh, multispectral imaging uh, later on we'll do some exercises on spectral curves unfortunately for the amount that we have we don't have uh, multispectral imaging so we can still do something because uh, each image that we have is actually a composition of the, the, the RGB, so the red, green, and blue channels. So we can still plot something, and with, which allows us to at least be able to compare different uh, materials, different pigments, different uh, features from one page to another, uh, done and done under the same uh, system. We, we, we can't identify pigments just for, for, for the RGB, but we can actually compare uh, different uh, pigments on the same page through these uh, spectral curves, which is what we'll do in the exercise later. This is an example of an application of this system. And this was, uh, this is uh, a manuscript from uh, Philadelphia. Um, and uh, in this case, we wanted to understand what happened there, uh, what what was that stain in the middle of the of the page whether it was something that's completely new and uh, has nothing to do with the with the object that happened in its history or there's something that actually happened in a very spe spe uh, specific time of uh, of the object and actually by analyzing the spectral curves uh, it was evident that actually this uh, stain was done at the same time as the uh, manuscript being written by a sloppy copist that was basically spilling uh, all the ink on the page and in fact it spilled both the ink at the very center on the of the green dot uh, you get the uh, spilling spillage of the ink for the text and the blemish the, that's around it is a spillage of the ink that was used to do the ruling of the uh, of the manuscript so this all happened at the same time as the uh, the uh, manuscript was written, and you and and the uh, plotting of the reaction to the lights of the different materials allows us to actually to identify the uh, the materials without having to do any other kind of uh, destructive analysis on the object. So which is kind of cool. Multispectral imaging only get us as far as, you know, as identifying uh, generic materials. If we want to get more details, we have to go into different kind of uh, 
spectral analysis like XRF, FTR, uh, false. But all these normally uh, act on a very specific and very tiny area. So multispectral imaging allows us to first get a mapping of all the different materials that we have on the object. And then we can actually say, oh, I need to understand better what happened here. And you can do XRF on one very specific dot or, or, <clears throat> or get different kind of analysis done on very specific areas of interest. Another different kind of advanced imaging that's been applied to books for quite a long time, since the 1950s or even earlier, uh, it's uh, X-ray photography usually for uh, the identification of uh, lacing patterns in uh, wooden boards. And more recently, we have a CT scan that has been applied to books. Now, the resolution of CT scans didn't used to be high enough for us to actually do much with objects. Now, with micro CT scanning and uh, different kind of uh, technologies actually we are getting to the point where actually we can use it to uh, identify features within uh, the books and in this case these are two images from the St. Catherine Gospel and uh, for the first time we were actually able to understand how the decoration of the cover had been done it was very many theories have been done over the years uh, by the way, by the way, uh, the binding of the St. Catherine Gospel is the oldest European binding still uh, in its original state. It's in original state because the book was bound and it was put into the coffin with a, with a, with a saint, and then uh, it was left there for centuries, and then was found again. And at that time, it, will, it had become a relic, so no one ever actually used the book as a book, which meant that the binding was preserved, and now we have, it's the oldest European binding in uh, existence. And it's very interesting also because it's a mixture, it has a mixture of features from the, uh, the, the Middle East bindings and uh, to the more uh, recent bindings. In, in Europe time, in Europe, in European areas. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, object and uh, the decoration was very particular and we we had clues of how it might have been done, but no one was sure because no one is going to actually go in and open up the binding to, uh, to actually see it. We see this kind of we can actually go inside and understand what's happening without destroying the object. So now we know a lot more about the object through CT scanning and still uh, looking at how we can actually use CT scanning to study book structures. There is a, um, a project running now uh, in uh, Toronto, University of Toronto, with some Mellon funding, which are using uh, more and more CT scanning to try and see whether how much information we can gather about the structure, the gathering structures, the sewing structures, whether we can actually follow this, uh, the sewing thread to reconstruct sewing structure. So there is a lot more that will be coming in the, in, the, in the next few years, which allows us to read the book as an object through uh, uh, advanced imaging. Unfortunately, not everything in a book can be gathered through direct acquisition. So through imaging or uh, photography or advanced imaging even. And I call these untransferable features, which doesn't mean that I'm not ever going to be transferable. It's just that I'm more difficult and more, they normally require actually the input from the human and uh, not direct acquisition. These are examples of things that we might want to study about the materiality of books and uh, that we don't normally can do through uh, normal imaging. Some of these you can, can be done through advanced imaging. Not everything can actually be done through advanced imaging. And I would like to get you uh, draw your attention to one particular kind of data that's all digitization method that comes over and over in this uh, table, which is the use of metadata. So for the most part, I believe that actually information about the materiality of an object, it's digitized through uh, metadata. And 
you can get a lot more information into digital through metadata, which actually links back to what we were uh, seeing yesterday about linked data because metadata is done uh, by humans and we actually decide to to do this through uh, linked data in order to be able to then expand our knowledge about the object and link into uh, to other databases. So all these untransferable features can be normally described through models and description metadata in order for us to be able to bring this into the digital and use this data into the digital. Um, we've seen that the first stepping stone was describing the, the physical features. And in order to be able to do this, we need standard description uh, vocabulary and methodologies. If we think about ways in which we've been looking at standards for describing manuscripts and methodologies, well, the first thing that comes to mind is the TEI. In fact, the chapter 10 of the TEI is all dedicated to manuscript description. And uh, a very specific part of this uh, chapter looks into the physical description. So we have, we have ways in which we can describe the uh, support. So the paper or parchment, uh, we can uh, measure the object. We can talk about the collection, so the ways in which the pages are grouped together and sewn into the text block. And there are uh, parts that also allows us to talk about bindings and uh, decoration. I'm using the word, the, the verb talk about because whereas for many other features, the TI goes into very high level of uh, granularity of details, for these, the TI takes its stand from the normal uh, cataloging tradition, which means that we get information, but the granularity is not high enough for us to actually to be able to do a lot with it. So uh, for material and support, you do get the tagged materials that allows you to at least identify that inside that tag you have paper or parchment, you can identify uh, watermarks, uh, but that's where you stop. For collection formulas, you can use the tag formula to say, okay, inside here you have a formula, you, or you can use the uh, P because you can actually describe this, the, the, the gathering structures with simple uh, sentences. Again, you do get to some information, but can we use the information? to do more with it, we'll see. When it comes to the bindings, all you get is binding. Material inside, decoration, but again, it's all black box into one big element that says binding, and then inside you had just a paragraph describing it without any more elements to describe it in a, in a more uh, detailed and uh, structured way. So yes, we, knew, we need to describe this uh, physical aspect through uh, standards. The TI give us, gives us a way to get to the information, but it kind of fails in a way that actually allows us to talk about it. It doesn't allow us to describe it into the detail that we need. You know, we need a detailed and actual description of this physical aspect. TI doesn't allow us to do that in this way. Let's take the example of the gathering structures. As we said, the gatherings are the ultimate working unit of the object. And when we digitize, we get these floating pages where we don't know which page is conjoined to the other in order to, to, to build up the bifolio. Now, traditionally, all this is described through collection formulas. And for, for uh, manuscript studies, there is not a standard that allows us to say, this is how you describe collection formulas. So, and all these are examples from the literature of true, you know, use collection formulas. And sometimes I find it, even I find it difficult to, I need to really concentrate to say, oh, this is what they mean, this is what they use for this and, the, and that. So it can be daunting to understand what we are looking at here. 
And uh, in the TI, as we've seen, we got formulas, so we can put the formulas inside, we can use paragraph, but you know, we don't get to a, a more defined way to actually describe all of this. A project that's this is the Viscol. Viscol was uh, born out of the idea uh, of uh, Dot Porter at um, the Schumann Institute for Management Studies at UPenn. And uh, I've been collaborating with her since 2013 to bring up this project and allow us to describe the gathering structures in a way that actually we can do stuff with it. So this is an overview of how, uh, how the, uh, the project works. And uh, so we have a way to describe the project through XML, to an XML model. And once we have the data in XML, we can use a transformation to actually do stuff with it. So on the one hand, we have the recording of how the gathering structures was put together. Uh, and then we also have uh, a way to actually represent the data in, in, uh, and show how the data was, you know, how the, how the things were actually put together. And uh, so we can do uh, automated diagrams like the one you see here on the, uh, the bottom right. We can do visualization whereby you can actually see together the pages that are conjoined. And on top of that, we are uh, working uh, towards the annotation module, which allows you to uh, describe or import taxonomies to describe features inside your uh, gathering structure or inside your uh, manuscript. And taking this information, annotating down to the page level, you can start opening up, opening up the model to, uh, to link data. So this is a snapshot of a way of a description of a manuscript according to Viscol. We'll look into this more in more detail into the exercises. And these are automated diagrams of very complex manuscripts. These are all true uh, examples. So this is actually um, a manuscript from the Machana Library in Venice. I, I'm not sure what happened here. Uh, but this is actually how the book is put together nowadays. It's true, it went through uh, conservation twice over the last century and before also had some uh, work done on it. But the model behind the this call is uh, so flexible, actually, you can actually describe this through the uh, XML uh, model and then the XSLT transformation, text information is able to take information out of the XML and transform this into these, uh, these diagrams. So these diagrams are done automatically on the basis of the XML that describes the, binding, the uh, gathering structure. Then the other representation is, as we said, this way in which we can actually see which pages are together forming the bifolium. And uh, so we can start to see, you know, if we want to look into the object and see which pages uh, were used together and uh, what features uh, we might want to find by looking at the uh, at the object in this way. Um, another thing is that sometimes pages are which used to be together inside the same object are actually now an ocean apart. This is an example of the uh, digital uh, of the uh, Galen select palimpsest. Uh, the big bulk of which is in uh, outside DC in the states right now. Other leaves are scattered throughout the world. And in this case, these two, uh, these, uh, these two pages were actually conjoined together in a region uh, when uh, the manuscript was in uh, St. Catherine. And uh, now they are in Ocean Apart. One is the Vatican Library, one is in DC. And uh, this call allows you to actually see how these two pages, you know, see them back together as they used to be. And uh, just as a side note, uh, the new version of EVT Edition visualization technology. Uh, it's now uh, including uh, this call as well as one of the visualization methodologies. We are in the process of actually making a lot of updates to this call uh, as an interface, not just uh, not so much on the model. And so this is in the, the website. And if you're interested, just keep on coming to the website, and more and more information will come from there. Now, the gathering structure is just one big thing about the book as a codec, as a, as a codex. 
but there are more steps that actually come together in order for us to be able to flip the pages of this object. And uh, one center that's been dedicated uh, to the study of the book as an object in digital format is Ligatus of the University of the Arts London. One of the first projects that they did was the study of the bindings in, at the Mercy of St. Catherine in Mount Sinai. This is a very important library for many different reasons. The main one of which is that the books were not that much used. So most of the bindings actually were original and they span a, a very large temporal uh, time, uh, but also geographical. Uh, Ligatus put together a way to describe the bindings through an XML schema, which can be found here, and which is the one that I'm using uh, in order to describe the bindings at the National Library for the project at uh, the DPH. Another project that stem out of that is the Language of Bindings Thesaurus, which is a thesaurus, so it describes terminology to describe book bindings, but it's all done according to uh, SCOS and uh, linked data uh, technology. So all of these concepts have a URI, which can be used to describe things in order for them to be ready for linked data. So once we have this description through digital technology, we can get to the last two stepping stones, whereby we can actually start to glean information, compare information, to uh, different uh, from different data sets and uh, then we can start comparing this with all the other things that we want to study about the book of course all its content its context its history and all the rest but in order to get there to get a much better understanding we need to be able to understand its materiality so what normally happens is that we have a lot of information about the content the context the history the significance of the object but what really concerns the materiality, it's not so much there, and it's definitely not so much there uh, in the digital medium. So if you need to study the object as the book as an object, you have to go to the library and you can't really get much information out of it from the catalogs. What my hope is that we can actually start to embrace more about the materiality of the object in order to get to a better interpretation of the object in the, in, in the end. So that we can actually get to digital cultural objects. So when, when we get to a digital representation of the object, we don't just get information about the content, but also about the whole thing, how it was built. Of course, we are talking about materiality, which is an emergent property. So there will still be information in about the object that's still just inside the object and uh, we can't just say okay we have everything in the digital now we can just never look at the object again which is not true but actually we are getting to the point where actually we get better information for some part on the in the digital then we go back to the original and this this creates a, a circular loop that actually gets us more information about the whole thing and, uh, and then we can progress our understanding and with this, we are concluded. Okay. Questions? There was one, there was one question raised um, uh, about the date of the uh, St. Cuthbert Gospel, and uh, Daniel was so kind to do some research in parallel. So it's the eighth uh, century, right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Well, if I may, uh, Alberto, thank you. That was that was fascinating, and um, I the way in which manuscript texts transmitted in manuscripts. Um, become disembodied from the books in the dig digital medium. That reminds me of the actual practice of philology. So in traditional textual scholarship, um, different versions, different manuscripts of a text are basically often treated as different versions of the text 
uh, hovering in some bodiless form. So, so as you know, scholars often forget about the manuscripts and and yeah. um, about their physical form, their their nature, their their materials, their historical context, and all the rest. Um, so, so perhaps it's a very easy temptation to think of the signs and to to um, forget the context and the often quite complex situations in which in which these these written signs of writing, this writing actually stands. Um, yes. um, I work uh, actually quite a lot with manuscripts myself, and um, I've been very annoyed for long that almost all the tools that I use for studying manuscripts come from the 19th century. So it's as if progress of technology has stopped, and the one the one tool that's often used that at modern at modern manuscript libraries that's 20th century is the light sheet to study to study. <laughs> Uh, working marks, but all the rest is from the 19th century, and I think that's quite silly. And um, for things like reading erased writing, I would love to have an um, um, M M MSI or whatever technology is appropriate and in an easy and portable format, please. So there is my wish list. So. Uh Multifaceted image is becoming portable. It's not quite you just shine your uh, your phone on it, but it's becoming more portable. Uh, one advice I always give to people who are interested in the in the book as an object and they can't get this in the reading room: if there is a conservation department, go and talk to the conservators. They they will have a, a list of wood lamp, so a UV lamp which allows you to at least to get information. You don't get the full spectrum but you can still see some more things. And if you do this in the conservation lab, you're actually able to touch the object in a much better way. You know, of course, supervised, you're not gonna ruin it, but in the reading room, they don't, don't allow you to do a lot of stuff that actually you need to do. Thank you. You're welcome. May I ask a question? Of course. Yes, thank you. Um, Alberto, thank you for a fascinating presentation. I'm very familiar with your work. I work on um, 13th and 15th century Spanish manuscripts and codicology, and I have um, tried Viscol. Um, I would wonder if you could speak to how the image list and the URLs work, because some archives have different forms of uh, URL of the of the whole manuscript or particular folios, and I've not been able to get the results with the images, but the diagrams work perfectly. Yeah, so the image list unfortunately depends on the uh, on the institution. If they're using AAAF, then it's a lot easier. You get the manifest, as you will see this afternoon, and you can get a full list of images in a very, a very easy way. Normally what happens is that they use a URL system. So if you can understand if there is like a progressive number or something like that, the first part of the URL will always be the same. And then you just need to uh, progress with the progressive number uh, from your first uh, one rector to your, you know, your last uh, leaf. But really it depends on how the institution is, uh, is working with the images. Sometimes you actually don't get the full URL because it's all hidden inside. So it depends. But with AAAF, it's a lot easier, and, and Paolo will talk about it this afternoon. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, can I ask a question? Can you yes. hear me? Yes, hi. I have a question in the, the, the case of palimpsest. Can this call actually help visualize how the original books have been like pulled apart and then pulled back together in the manuscript yes. we have now? Okay. Yes, because you are basically you are you know, the model is done by humans, so you can actually decide what which what you want to model, and then the images are reshuffled according to your model. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. So you would have you know, two uh, uh, different formulas, the one for an original state and one of the current state. Yes. In the same document, or would, how would this work? So, yeah. um, for the moment, it's one model. It's one model per uh, per status. So you will have different files, and you 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 name them according to what you want. Um, and I think this is the way it's going to stay. So still, it's going to be just one XML for per model. And we might have you know you might use to 
a different way, like nets or something, to put them together. But still, this code will just be just one model, I think. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto. If there are no further questions, we will now uh, um, separate each other into uh, the um, the class and meet the others again uh, for the presentation. Uh, by um, Paolo in the afternoon on IIIF. So everyone is uh, looking forward to this uh, because it's uh, so extremely useful to make all these wonderful tools work uh, smoothly. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining this session. And yeah, see you soon.